Good morning. Welcome to the All Souls Forum. It has been continuing since uh, 1945, I think it is. Uh, we are a program that presents current, live, important uh, issues that are ongoing. Now I'm going to introduce, I think, this morning's host, Mr. Craig LeBeau, who will tell us about Stan Thomas and Dee Bell, who are uh, going to discuss the law. All right, thank you, Rita. So I am Craig and I am a criminal defense attorney and also do family law too. And um, Stan Thomas, Oh, and, and as you all know, I also do some shows at KKFI. Stan Thomas also does shows at KKFI, and he is a retired police officer. I believe he was with the KC Mo department. Um, and David Bell is another criminal defense attorney. He's on the Missouri side and also does some shows for us on Jobs of Justice. We are going to talk about some hot button cases um, that have occurred in self-defense as it relates to police officers and also self-defense as it relates to individuals because we had the case in Georgia where a former police officer and his son chased down and shot the uh, black guy there. And then the Rittenhouse case in Wisconsin, which is where the guy, he killed two people and wounded a third. And he went to, um, I forget the name of the town in Wisconsin on the eastern side of the state, to supposedly protect businesses. And he goes, went there with an uh, assault rifle. Um, and ended up killing two people and wounding third. And he was just found not guilty, uh, which was a shock to me. Um, so we're good to talk about that. We also get to talk about a few other types of Supreme Court cases, one being uh, First Amendment issues for freedom of speech, where there was a girl who was a cheerleader, used some I can't say what she said, but she used some obscene language on her Instagram post. And then she was suspended by the school for doing that. Um, of course, that was off school property. Um, so I think David will talk about that. And then if we have time, we'll talk about some other stuff. And so I will let, let me let David start out. Great. Thank you. Stan. Uh, thanks, Craig. And I'm glad Stan is here based on his you know, 41 years of experience as a KCPD police officer. I first wanted to talk about self-defense and the issue of self-defense among individuals, and then we can add in police officers. And before we go into it, there's a few things that to think about. The first is to uh, kind of avoid something that I do is project my own beliefs on a situation and then try to fight for those beliefs, even though that's really not the question being asked. I'll give you an example of that. We're going to talk about the Rittenhouse case. We can talk about it now uh, in Wisconsin. The idea of a 17-year-old with a, with, a, with a rifle uh, appearing on the street there is absurd. And I think that uh, whoever's involved in supplying that to the individual, allowing him to roam, is, is, should be prosecuted. That being said, that's not the question there. And so we want to be careful about that. Um, so when we talk about that issue, uh, let's talk about framing what self-defense means. And there's a few uh, concepts. The first is uh, initial aggressor. You, generally speaking, you do not have the right to use self-defense in a situation where you have caused uh, the situation to rise that then requires you to use force. So if I go up and push stand down as an individual, not as a police officer, and he gets up and comes at me, I can't then take out a gun and shoot him and claim self-defense because I started it, if you will. The other issue that comes into being is that there is in many states now, there's no duty to retreat. Uh, and I, I think we've heard that used in some capacities kind of stand your ground. But the idea is if I have a legal right to be somewhere 
then that in that that presence in and of itself, I don't think can be used as a negative against me in making a self determination or a determination on self defense. So for example, if I'm a 17 year old walking around on the streets of Wisconsin, with a with an assault rifle, that fact alone is not determinative of my right to use self defense, because as it turns out in that state, you're allowed to do that as crazy as that may sound. One of the other issues that I wanted to bring up and then we can get into maybe how to evaluate it and talk to Stan and Craig is we also want to look at, remember how biases play in. I'm sure all of you remember the, uh, the judge in that case when he kicked the original gun charge. And we, if you read about that, this is before it went to the jury. And of course, a lot of uh, individuals, including myself, were like, oh, geez, the fix is in. And if you remember, he also made a, it sounded, could be a derogatory comment about Asian food. He said, quote, I hope the Asian food isn't coming, isn't on one of those boats in Long Beach Harbor, something that had absolutely nothing to do with the case other than to affirm what all, us all believe that the fix was in. Of course, as it turns out, the current wording of the, of the law says any person under age, uh, 18 years of age or under who possesses or goes armed with a dangerous weapon is guilty of a class A misdemeanor. However, a subsection says that that only applies to a short barrel shotgun or rifle. And in this case, the state, uh, the state agreed on the record that they didn't have evidence that it was too short of a gun. So that's one of those situations where my original bias is prejudice looking like, oh, geez, the fix is in. This guy, you know, loves Rittenhouse. He's going to get off. Turned out not to be right, at least as to this. The final thing I wanted to mention, and then we can generally talk about the cases, is when we talk about we talk about this situation and situation in other in the other states, is you always need to look at the statutes and you need to look at the jury instructions. That's where this is going to uh, be evaluated. And a lot of times that is different than what you think should happen. Uh, a lot of the law in its, itself, at least as I have seen it, is the floor of human behavior. It's certainly not the ideal to which we should strive. And if you want an example of that, just note as if you're, if you're laying on the floor inches away from your inhaler or EpiPen and I walk by and I decide not to help you and you die, I cannot be prosecuted in most states. That's not the right thing to do, but the law does not allow me to be prosecuted. So I want you to differentiate as we go through this between the, the floor of human behavior, which is where the law is, and the ideal of which we should all be uh, um, uh, striving for. And I think with that, Stan, I, when you, as a former police officer with 41 years of experience, when you first saw the Rittenhouse case, and then as you looked maybe at the trial a little bit and then at the result, what were your initial impressions? Well, to begin with, um, I understand people have the right to bear arms, but to bring a assault rifle, which is not something that you would call for personal protection, to a chaotic uh, situation, you're asking for trouble. Okay? If I saw a 17-year-old on the street, and let's, let's look at our, our country. You can't even get into the service with a no, military rifle to your 18. So a 17 year old coming to a situation that's already chaotic and you have an assault rifle, I personally would have stopped it and probably confiscated it and let him get it back to the corpse. But uh, let's assume under the law, which it is here in Wisconsin, that he was allowed to be there with an assault rifle walking around. As crazy as that sounds, and that's why going to the statute and the jury instruction is so important, how then do you look at it from that point forward? Again, oh, what are you trying to protect? You know, do you have property in that area? Do you have loved ones in that area? I mean, you're asking, you're asking for trouble bringing something like that. You 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 left the house with a purpose. My so, opinion, right? You know, you left the house with the purpose. A loaded assault rifle. Assault rifles are meant to kill people. You're not going hunting for deer. <laughs> I'm sorry. This just, and I understand. I can only look at it from the law that I grew up with. So, and, and, and by the way, Stan, I completely agree with you. And I started out with that, but let me look, look at the law that which they, in the testimony, 
The law of self-defense allows the defendant to threaten or intentionally use force against another only if the person believed there was the actual or imminent unlawful interference with the defendant's person that that was happening and that the defendant believed that the amount of force he used or threatened to use was necessary to terminate that, terminate that interference. So it's uh, that there was an actual or imminent unlawful interference with the defendant's person. So here's a brief testimony that came out. Witnesses at the trial testified that the first man shot and killed, Joseph Rosenbaum, 36, was, quote, hyper-aggressive and acting belligerently that night and threatened to kill Rittenhouse at one point. One witness said Rosenbaum was gunned down after he chased Rittenhouse and lunged for the young man's rifle. Rosenbaum's killing set in motion the bloodshed that followed moments later when Rittenhouse killed Anthony Huber, a 26-year-old protester seen on bystander video hitting Rittenhouse with a skateboard. And then the final person, this is the person who uh, Craig indicated had was injured, a protester and volunteer medic wounded on the streets of Kenosha by Kyle Rittenhouse testified that he was pointing his own gun at the rifle toting Rittenhouse unintentionally, he said, when the young man shot him. And so, Stan, if we get past the, the what I will call the, the almost innate repulsive nature of a 17-year-old walking around the streets with, a, with an AR-15, and we go into the moment, it would seem like the jury instructions here would say that, hey, if you're allowed to be there with that gun, as repulsive as it is, then if someone comes and attacks you, you can shoot and kill them. And if someone comes to smack you over the head with a skateboard and you believe your, your, uh, um, your, your physical safety uh, is somehow in jeopardy, then you're allowed to use that gun. Well, strictly on putting it like that, at that point, you are trying to protect yourself. Um, but, you know, again, I, ha I have to go back to, in, in the state of Wisconsin, that party would still be considered juvenile. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Although there is a, the, go ahead, go ahead, Stan. The law states that we're not, a 17 year old is not allowed to make most adult decisions. That's right. Because they're not an adult until they're 18. I think he was actually tried as an adult, waived to adult status, if I remember. Is that right, Dave? I don't know if he was waived. He was definitely, definitely tried. But the, yeah. the issue that, that Stan, you're going to is more of a structural issue in the law, which I agree with. But the, my analysis here was, did they follow the law as is written, as horrific a decision as it appears to be? That's why when they pass these statutes that a 17-year-old presumably or somebody can walk around the street waving a gun or having a gun on his, uh, on his shoulder, a, a semi-automatic semi AR-15, that, that we would hopefully stand up if we believe that's not right, because these are the type of situations that it, that it breeds. Point to raise, uh, to think about, to ponder, is I'm wondering if the Rittenhouse case is a really good poster type case to show how the Supreme Court has maybe gone too far in its right to bear arms interpretation? When they first passed the CCW law, I was on the street and I was afraid that, that this was gonna get out of hand. Okay, most citizens would have a fear of being booked on a felony for having an unlawful weapon. But now at this point, seeing as how that is not the case that much anymore, we've almost become the wild, wild west. Mm -hmm. Homicides, assaults are at a record pace because nobody has a fear of taking a gun out of their house anymore. It's, it's fascinating to me, Stan, that there is no law or at least there is no, there is no push in society, regardless of whether it's a law or not to say that your duty as a, as a citizen, as a member of society, is to de-escalate a situation first. Because certainly that's what I would teach to my children, that's what I would expect to my friends, that's what I expect to my family. If you're in a situation, you need to de-escalate first. What I'm worried about what some of these laws say is you don't have to de-escalate. You can stand your ground, puff your chest out, and if that person puffs his or her chest out back at you, then you can go for your gun. But the, you know, again, the problem is that we as police officers are trained to de-escalate situations the best that we can. John Q. Citizen does not have that training. Right, and that's, uh, and we, right, we, and we see that problem a lot because a lot of citizens aren't trained to deal with stress, adrenaline, 
high levels of it um, that, that occur in short periods of time. And, and the other question is um, how much of the jury's decision was strictly based upon the law versus the sympathy vote because of that very dramatic Academy Award winning breakdown that he supposedly had in court there. Right. With the crying, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can tell you that from what I've looked at, if you can get over the idea of him being there with a gun and he's st then, then, then it, then it becomes what Stan says is the wild West. And in the wild West, I think it's going to be hard for the law to dictate uh, who is defending whom against, you know, who is defending themselves against some other threat. Everyone's a threat. Everyone's self-defense. It's like an and MMA they, cage fight is what it winds up being. Who's, who's the, who's the responsible party there? And David, you and Craig have been in courtrooms and, most people are not going to, they don't want to upset the judge. So if a judge gives you specific instructions, that weighs heavily upon your decision. Like That's you right. said, David, the fix was in. Right. Well, and I would say it was in by the, by the, the way the law was written. And so going to, to Chauvin real quick, and remember Chauvin is the case of the, the, um, the officer that was, that was kneeling on the back or the throat of George Floyd, you know, one of the elements that that adds in is the authorized use of force by a police officer. And here's from the instructions from that case. It says, no crime is committed if a police officer's actions were justified by the police officer's use of reasonable force in the line of duty in effectuating or in effecting a lawful arrest or preventing an escape from custody. The kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties is limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary. Any use of force beyond that is not reasonable. To determine if the actions of the police officer were reasonable, you must look at those facts which a reasonable officer in the same situation would have known at the precise moment the officer acted with force. And I guess I, the other thing I wanted to point out in this case, and I want to hear if it's okay from Stan based on his experiences, let me read the jury instructions. There, there was, he was committed, Chauvin was committed to three felonies. Let me read the most serious, just so everyone understands um, how it worked. So the first element is the death of George Floyd occurred, which it did. The second element is that defendant caused the death of George Floyd. The third element, and this is the big one, the defendant at the time of causing the death of George Floyd was committing or attempting to commit the felony offense of assault in the third degree. Assault is the intentional infliction of bodily harm upon another or the attempt to inflict bodily harm upon another. The intentional infliction of bodily harm requires proof that the defendant intentionally applied unlawful force to another person without that person's consent and that this, uh, that this act resulted. So uh, the, the issue here is, and we see this with felony murder, and that's in Missouri as an example. If I steal a car, and I'm driving at a high rate of speed, that's a felony. If I wind up, God forbid, hitting a, someone walking in the street, and I never got out, I never thought about that in the morning I woke up, and surely wasn't thinking about it at the moment, but I'm not paying attention, and I hit someone and kill someone. Because I'm in the commission of a felony, the death of that person is automatically on me as if I took out a gun and shot him. And that's what, uh, that's what Chauvin was convicted of here, along with some other things. I'm curious, Stan, what were your thoughts about about the, that verdict. I know that was heavily watched by law enforcement. I got to tell you, I used that, that particular technique hundreds of times. But we are trained. Because, well, let me go back. The, the theory is if you can pin a person's neck, the rest of the body can't go anywhere. But we are trained that once you have that person under control, that you set him up. In my opinion, uh, three things killed Floyd. Number one, he was high on meth, okay? Number two, he's a big boy. If you put a heavier person on their chest, there's a thing called positional asphyxiation that doesn't allow the diaphragm to expand and let them breathe. But even in using that particular technique, once they had that man cuffed, they should have set him up. There was three other officers who should have taken that officer off of his neck and set him up. Had any one of those things differed, that man would still be alive today. 
I believe that that officer was 100% wrong by staying on his neck for eight minutes. Also, there was another factor which I'm guessing might have weighed heavily on the jury's minds, which really goes to somewhat whether or not Chauvin was being malicious at the time. And that was because Chauvin was working when he was off duty at the same bar that Chauvin, that Floyd had worked at. They worked at the same place and they had evidence of at least one, if not a couple of adverse encounters between the two of them. And so in my mind, then it was a question then whether or not it was malicious on Chauvin's part because apparently he didn't like Floyd. Well, and, and let me read the, again, this last part of the instruction, the kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties is limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary. Any use of force beyond that is, uh, is not reasonable. And Stan, what I hear you saying, and this goes to Craig, your point as well, is that the initial takedown, the initial knee to the neck, knee to the back, that's acceptable. That's a reasonable police officer's force. But as the seconds ticked by and then into minutes, it's, it moved into unreasonable pretty quick. And that's probably where he lost sympathy with the jury. Does that sound right? Absolutely. Like I said before, uh, the knee to the back of the neck controls the party. The other officers got him in cuffs. He was no longer a threat. At that point, they should have set that man up. But, but Stan, I, I want to ask you a question about that. It, you mentioned this, and I hear this a lot, that, well, but he was high. And, and, and I guess to me, the relevance of that statement, well, I don't know what the relevance of the statement is, because I, I don't, on the one hand, I think I can very easily veer off into dehumanizing, right? That's something that can happen pretty easily. He's crackhead, he's meth head, whatever. But he's entitled to the same treatment, if you will, by a police officer. On the other hand, it surely does have an effect, it would seem to me, on, on or, or at least, ha I don't want to say it. There's a, a theory in, in legal field called eggshell skull rule. You, like, take, you, you get the victim as you find him, right? If he's got an eggshell skull, then, then you're responsible for it. And I wonder if that's kind of the same here. So I'm, I'm kind of having a hard time in my mind understanding, although in, innately it seems like it would matter, but why him being high would matter to Houston? Well, number one, maybe if he wasn't high, he wouldn't have resisted in the first place. Number two, uh, him being high, still, once you get him in cuffs, if you set him up on his posterior, on his butt, and kept his legs straight out, most people will not be able to get up and resist you any further. If they try to, you put pressure on their shoulders to keep them on their butt until your transportation gets there. The bottom line is they should have set that man up and got him off his chest. And there was three other officers. And, you know, as a police officer, you have to understand that a lot of times your emotions do get involved there. And maybe, uh, maybe that, uh, maybe was beyond, you know, his limit. But as officers, we're also trained to play tag. If I see somebody out of control, I go over there and pull that officer off of them like I got him. So you don't get into a situation like that. You don't end up doing excessive force. You don't end up in front of internal affairs. There was three other officers who should have de-escalated that situation. Well, and, and, but, and going one more point, Stan, just based on 41 years of experience, you know, in my own profession, legal profession, it is difficult to self-regulate. When I say self-regulate, I mean regulate others who have been through the same experiences. And I don't go to work with a gun on, and I'm not chasing after people trying to kill me, and I'm not dealing with, I mean, I've got stresses, but they're stresses I can handle in a suit and maybe a cold compress, right? So I don't have the same type of stresses. So I can imagine going through shared experiences like you have, uh, where you're, you're almost in a, a very stressful situation, the idea of being able to call out somebody else, with, particularly someone of a higher rank than you, or someone that you've been in the bunker with, if, if that you know, analogy makes sense, it almost seems like an impossible task. So those other officers that were there, you know, they all could have done something, they didn't. 
and, and I'm not trying to excuse their behavior, but I absolutely am trying to understand that. I assume you had a similar feel or similar inclinations, perhaps, when you were uh, on the street? I have pulled other officers off of suspects. Other officers have seen me a little upset and said, Stan, I got this. You know, a lot of times it's just that moment of clarity. Somebody comes in and puts their hand on the shoulder and says, I got this. And it, it allows you to wake up and realize and look at what you're doing and allows you the time to back off. I worked the streets for 30 years. You know, I wasn't one who sat behind a desk. I drove a patrol car. I drove a patrol wagon. I was out in the meat of it every night. And I got to tell you that, like I said, and again, what people don't realize is officers have personal lives and sometimes it bleeds over. If I, David, if I knew you were going through a divorce and you were about edgy, I'm watching you, how you handle a call. If I see you getting a little irritated, I'll pull you aside and say, I got this. Because I don't want either one of us to end up in a fight or in front of internal affairs trying to explain our actions or at the very worst in front of a jury of 12. But, but I wonder, is it too much to ask is it too much to ask of human beings, whether police officers or any, anyone else, to, to be able to rev up, to go from zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds, and then be in a physical altercation, but then be able to maintain professionalism, if there's such a thing, in the, in the uh, in, in a physical altercation? I got to tell you, we are a special breed. Most cops are adrenaline junkies. Okay, you get ramped up and sometimes from the time you leave the station to the time you get back, it's one call to call to call. But one of the things that you have to, especially once you become a veteran officer, what a lot of people don't realize is most officers on the street have zero to three years old. So they're learning. And I, I, anybody in the, in the forum here, uh, I ask you, how good were you with three years into your current position. You know, you were still learning. And these are the officers who are being judged on the street every day. But again, you have to work as a team. Okay. And if you, you are ramped up, a lot of times, if you feel yourself ramped up, I would take an extra five minutes before I got back in service. You know, and then go to the next call, you know, unless there was something of dire emergency. Mm -hmm. Stand okay. How, how much of it is also the result in some jurisdictions, you know, when they screen police officers to hire them, different jurisdictions do more screening than other jurisdictions and stuff. How much of that contributes to these issues, these incidents occurring? You know, in the state of Missouri, they have class A, class B, class C uh, cities based on population, mm -hmm. okay? And Kansas City runs a regional uh, training academy for class A and class B cities, I believe. And it'll, this is the way it used to be. I'm not sure. Again, I've been out for 13 years from full time, but you know, the Missouri Post requires 640 hours of training for class A and class B uh, officers before you can be certified as a police officer. Not to mention ongoing in-service training every year. Okay, smaller jurisdictions, I cannot say for sure what those requirements are or how much training they actually get. Well, and also I'm thinking too of the psychiatric um, screening because there's some people who just probably are not cut out to be officers. You have to look at, and again, do not quote me on these numbers, but if you got a hundred people to apply as a police officer, maybe, maybe 50% will make it through the psychological, the written, and the physical to get to the academy. Out of that 50, you may graduate 25 of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, one of the other things, Stan, that, and then we, I think after this point, I think it's probably time for a little bit of a break, but, but the other one of the things I've seen both with, um, 
with prosecutors and particularly police officers is the responding to high conflict, high pain areas, just witnessing those things would create what I can only describe as a PTSD like condition to see that day in and day out. And I do wonder the extent to which police officers, particularly of your generation and maybe the newer generation are willing to consider therapy, something uh, that they can do other than just lifting weights to process the incredible amounts of trauma that they've seen. And, and this came, the thought came to me, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a prosecutor and he shows up at every homicide during a particular period of time, every homicide in Kansas City. Oh my God, to show up at the scene, I get pictures of it later, right? It's still horrific, but to show up and actually see the body, to smell the scene, to hear the cries has got to be traumatic day in and day out. And I'm wondering from your standpoint and then the newer police officers, how, what is there to deal with that in a healthy way? Oh, um, the biggest thing is to be able to vent to your other officers or it even helps to be able to vent to your spouse. Uh, also, the department does have a, they offer psychological help for anybody who wishes to go. And as a sergeant or, uh, within the station, it's the supervisor's uh, job to see if that person is acting out of character. So, you know, there are levels of help that an officer can get. I was lucky enough with all the stuff I, I saw over the years, I was fortunate enough to be able to handle it. Everybody can't. And I'm gonna go back to those numbers. I gave you about 25 coming out of the academy. Out of that 25, maybe 15 will finish the career. Because maybe once they get on the street, this is what, not what they thought it would be. I couldn't handle the stress or end up in some other job. You know, the, the case of Kimberly Potter, this was the officer that uh, grabbed for a taser, but then grabbed a gun and shot and killed the uh, a motorist that had been pulled over. Well, let me read you the really quick, the complaint from that, meaning the charging document so that we all understand what she was convicted of, because I think well, I don't know. I can say personally, do I believe she meant to kill somebody during that interaction? I think that would be difficult to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt, but that's not what she was charged with. Let me tell you what she was charged with. It said that while committing the offense of misdemeanor, reckless handling or use of a firearm so as to endanger the safety of another with such vo force and violence that, great, that death or great bodily harm to any person was reasonably foreseeable. Let me read the whole thing. It's um, on or about April 11, 2021, in the city of Minnesota, defendant Kimberly Potter caused the death of Dante Demetrius Wright while committing the misdemeanor offense of reckless handling or use of a firearm so as to endanger the safety of another with such force and, and violence that, great, that death or great bodily harm to any person was reasonably foreseeable. And that's a lot different than me being accused of taking a gun out and uh, intentionally shooting someone, and I'll read the elements real quick, that the, 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 defend, the, the death of Dante Wright was caused by defendant committing the crime of reckless handling or use of a firearm. There are two elements of reckless handling or use of a firearm. First, the defendant recklessly handled or used a firearm. A person acts recklessly if under the totality of the circumstances she commits a conscious or intentional act in connection with the handling or use of a firearm that creates a substantial and unjustifiable risk that she is aware of and disregards. Second, the defendant handled or used the firearm so as to endanger the safety of another person. And here's this key point that we see in a lot of these jury instructions that people kind of miss. It says, it is not necessary for the state to prove any intent on the part of the defendant to kill anyone. I'm wondering, uh, Stan, from your, from your standpoint, I know they, you know, I've never shot a taser, but I, I know they're shaped differently. They're colored differently. You put them on different sides of your body. H help us understand what happened in this particular case and whether or not you agreed with the verdict. And, and if you did or you didn't, why or why not? Uh, first of all, this was a tragedy. Okay. I can only, again, speak from the way we were trained. When we received tasers, number one, we were instructed to put them on the non-lethal side of our belt. Number two, the particular equipment we had, the holster was around our leg as opposed to being on our gun belt. Oh. So you've got 
Now, two things to keep you away from grabbing that. It's on your left side and it's slung lower down around your leg. So as we decided to use the taser, and thank God I never had to use, I did pull it, but thank God I never had to use it. You were doing it with your non-lethal side. And they actually sent us home when we first got them because we were, we checked them out at the station. But during training, they actually sent you home with one so you could wrap it around your left leg or, you know, if it's you're left-handed around your right leg, so you could practice pulling that for that particular instance. Hmm. Now, that particular department, did they have their equipment set like that? I don't know. Okay, I can only tell you the way that we were trained. And when I went for my taser, it was ingrained in my, because taser training was a 40 hour course. Wow. So like I said, for five days, we actually got to take one home, hook it to our gun belt and practice at home going specifically for that. You know, the same thing happened to uh, the Oakland officer uh, um, at the uh, BART station, whereas he would to, he thought he was reaching for his taser and reach for his weapon and end up killing someone. It is a tragedy. But again, I cannot speak to how they were trained and where that taser was on her gun belt as opposed to where her lethal weapon was. But is this, so but should this have been an indictment and a conviction of the system that gave rise to her training versus her individually? Meaning that meaning the fault lies with the structure that put her taser in the wrong place potentially, or didn't give her enough training to avoid this, this particular instance. Dave, one of the things too is on that, part of the evidence was that besides her being trained, she was actually training other people at that point. Wow. So, well, but, the, but then going back to Stan, the question is, and if she's not getting the right training, then she's not able to be the, she, she shouldn't, she's not in a position to, to, to train others in the right way. Once you were trained, you were told to, I can't say you were told. Once you were trained, you had the option to where the taser where it was coming. Now, did she, did she deviate from what she was trained? Again, I don't know. I don't know what that department's training was on how to handle the taser and where to put the taser. Okay. And again, I don't know how many stressful situations she has been in. Okay. If you work for Maryville, Missouri, you don't get into that many confrontations. So, you know, you may react differently from where if you worked in Kansas City, from where if you worked in New York City, where you're in something like that every day. You know, again, I don't know what that department's, how many times they get into something like that. You know, a highway patrolman is gonna act differently from a city officer, simply because to be honest about it, most highway patrolmen write tickets. Whereas most city officers are thrown in domestic disturbances, fights, and that type of chaos. Mm -hmm. I can't say for sure, you know, and the bottom line is, a lot of times when you fear, you go to what you grab for the most. And unfortunately, it seems like her fear was to grab for her weapon and she didn't have time because at that point, they were just trying to get the gentleman out of the uh, car. From and, and, what I've seen, there was no weapon presented. So why did you go for your weapon? in the front? Well, and Stan, that goes into maybe what would be our final question before we take start taking uh, questions from the audience, which is as follows. You mentioned that the taser is a 40 hour a week, 40 hour training course. I'm sure firearms, I know has got to be as long or longer. Plus you have probably repeated certification over a period of time. With regard to the term de-escalation or I'll call them soft skills. What, how many hours of training is that a year? Meaning the impression I get is, is that you, is that the training is all done with the hard stuff, the hard equipment, the taser, the spray, the, the gun, and I'm wondering how much is done with this, the part that I'm going to call de-escalation, which requires more mental acuity and ability to verbalize. 
again, uh, our in service was two to three days, eight hours a day, and de escalation was always a part of it. But, you know, be truthful about it, David. That's where your veteran officers talk to the younger officers and try to get that done. Uh, and I will give you an example. Uh, I learned I had about six months on, and a veteran officer took me off to the side and said, Stan, if you can get a suspect to answer three questions, you generally don't have to put your hands on them. I'm saying, sure, tell me anything. That evening, we went into a boyfriend-girlfriend disturbance, and this guy backed into his, a corner with his fist up and said, I ain't going to jail tonight. The officer says, partner, let me ask you three questions. He says, what's that? He says, have you ever fought the police before? The guy said, yeah. He says, have you ever won? The guy said, no. He says, well, what makes you think you're going to win today? And the guy turned around. We never had to put our hands on him. And that's what I used, in, I, and that's what I taught the younger officers throughout my entire career. If you can get them to think before getting into a physical altercation, things can go a lot better. I think that's a great story, by the way. And I wish that, I don't know how you, it, 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 it seems dependent upon the older officers training now, but it seems to me that would be a great module, whatever it may be. But um, I did want to talk this a couple of minutes about that case involving the cheerleader, because I think First Amendment issues are going to be getting bigger with the makeup of the new Supreme Court. Sure. The, I think the, the issue on the, on the so, it, by the way, we see this a lot in school cases now where, unfortunately, and you know, I work in Kansas and Missouri and Johnson County, big school district, Kansas and Missouri big school districts, and there's an idea of being able to, wanting to criminalize every behavior ever in school now, whereas I think it used to be something you go in the principal's office and go back and forth maybe and get in trouble there. Now the police seem to be called. In this case, it says over a weekend and away from school, this uh, teenager posted a picture of herself on Snapchat with the caption, and I'm not even going to say it. It'll be, uh, you know, uh, F school, F softball, F cheer, F everything. <laughs> so the photo was visible to about 250 people, many of whom were students and some of who were cheerleaders. Several students who saw the caption photo approached the coach and expressed concern that the snap was inappropriate. The coaches decided that the snap violated school team and school rules which she had acknowledged before joining the team, and she was suspended from the junior varsity team for a year. A BL sued the school, alleging that her suspension from the team violated the First Amendment, that the school and team rules were overbroad and viewpoint discriminatory, and that those rules were unconstitutionally vague. So that's where we were. And the question was, does the First Amendment prohibit school officials from regulating off-campus student speech? Greg, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think the school has jurisdiction to tell ha students how to behave out of school. And I think it's not only a First Amendment issue, but I think it goes to privacy issues. I think the school's invading the privacy of students <laughs> when they start getting involved in the, those kinds of cases. Right. And I th so as with everything, it's a balancing act. And the school absolutely has the a right to, to, to regulate speech on campus. The issue is whether they can do it off campus. And the, uh, the, what the court said is the three features of off-campus speech diminish the, diminish the need for First Amendment leeway. Uh, off-campus speech normally falls within the scope within the zone of parental responsibility rather than school responsibility to off-campus speech regulations coupled with on-campus speech regulations would mean a student cannot gauge in the regulated type of speech at all. And three, the school itself has an interest in protecting a student's unpopular off-campus expression because the free market place of ideas is a cornerstone of our representative democracy. Um, and I guess, go ahead, go ahead. Dave, wasn't, was that case decided before or after Justice Barrett joined the Court. I, this was decided on June 23rd, 2021. So I don't know. Okay. That I don't was, know when that was. Yeah, that was after. All right. And so the issue is, is that, is that they're really looking at schools being able to regulate speech, but they limit it essentially to in situations that materially disrupts classwork or, inv or uh, involves a substantial disorder or invasion of rights of others. And so I think ultimately 
they decided that the school had gone too far. So, but David, uh, I would agree with that, except to when that speech becomes a threat. Correct. And I think that's going to be, I think that's, I think that is, that still exists. Absolutely. But it's difficult. I, we see that all the time now. I'll tell you the biggest thing we see is for some reason, and maybe, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, thank God I didn't grow up with cell phones because I'd be in prison right now, probably because every child seems to be sending pictures of themselves to other children, sending these type of messages to other children. They send things that appear to be, um, could be viewed as threats by us, by adults, but yet the children, when I say children, anybody under the age of 18 don't necessarily realize what they're saying. So it's a, it's a big deal because you, of course, you're carrying that cell phone in that's part of you and that's going into the student environment and, and outside the student environment. So I think that finishes up that, that case. So I guess if you're on a cheer team and you want to go on a Snapchat and, and say what she said, I guess they can't, they can't, you're not going to be kicked off the cheer team. So. Yeah. So you made a comment about the right to bear arms. Uh, I'm curious it, if you were a true originalist, would the right to bear arms not apply only to muskets? So I, I think uh, I think is the originalist is we're going to go back and see what what was meant at the time of the adoption. Is that essentially how you would interpret the, the term originalist? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, they, when the right to bear arms was written in there, they didn't have AK forty sevens; they had muskets. So these originalists that want to overturn all this past precedent and say right to bear arms applies to everything and everyone should own a gun. I, I, I'm curious as to, you know, did the founding fathers really intend for semi-automatics to be owned by everyone? No. I'm not a big fan of the originalist viewpoint, so I, I can't, because the, the idea that we're going to look back to 200 years ago as to what Lord Fauntleroy thought and not take into account our current experiences and knowledge and reason, I think is absurd. I think the problem, though, is when you go too far afield from the principles upon which the country was founded. And so there's that there's that there's a tension there. But I, I absolutely agree with you. And frankly, I think sometimes the originalist is just a means to an end. It's just that we adopt this argument to produce this result versus some versus some other argument. So, you know, Chuck, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Stan. You know, I believe everybody has the right to defend their family. Okay. But once it gets beyond your residence and you're taking automatic weapons to scenes, you know, as, uh, let's look at that couple in St. Louis where they were standing on their grounds pointing guns at people walking down the sidewalk. Okay. Again, you haven't come up, come on their property as a public sidewalk, but yet you're committing an assault every time you point that weapon at somebody. That's right. There, there yeah, is there, a... There, there's got to be a boundary, you know, of the right to bear arms and to protect one's life and property, okay? But once you go beyond that, now you're, you're going out looking for an assault. Just my opinion. There's a question in the chat window. It says, did Rittenhouse's mother break any law in the course of the purchase of his gun or driving him to the demonstration? I, I, if I remember right, and it, this is not now I'm just making stuff up, but I think he supposedly picked the gun up in the state of Wisconsin. I don't know if his mother actually brought him there with the gun in the car, or how it was purchased. So I don't know the answer to that. That question. Yeah, I, I don't know where he got the gun. I know she did drive him to the. She did drive him. Yeah. Right. So but your I think son that, is not old enough to drive, but he's old enough for you to take him to a protest with a weapon. Right. So that's where I think the mother's went. And by the way, you see that in the the child that was shooting at a, I forgot what high school, where the parents uh, allowed the child or purchased the child the handgun. In and Michigan. Went in, in Michigan, and went able yeah. to to shoot to shoot people. And I I don't. Uh, they have been charged now. They're charged with the accessory to murder or whatever. So um, so it says a phone interview, uh, Rittenhouse revealed that the gun he used in the shooting was purchased using money he received from an unemployment check. Rittenhouse could not legally purchase the weapon, so he gave the money to a friend to buy it for him. Uh, I got my $1,200 from the cor coronavirus Illinois employment because I was on furlough from YMCA. And so I, then he went to buy it. 
And then, oh, and then it says online court records show prosecutors charged 19 year old Dominic Black on November 3rd with two felony counts of supplying a dangerous weapon to a minor causing death. Um, he could face up to 25 years in prison. So he will be testified. The mother, I mean, I just, anyway, I, it's insanity. I will say there is seem to be this a concept, at least with those individuals that are pushing more of this individual rights to everyone walking around with a gun. It's almost a, almost this wild west mentality to society uh, overall. And I think that's can be a little bit scary, but Chuck and, or Ch are Chuck and Karen the next questions? I was just wondering back with the George Floyd case, the, you talked about those other three police officers standing around and, you know, if things had gone as they should have gone, they should have uh, helped him sit up or whatever. Were, were those three charged or disciplined in any way to your knowledge? I was just wondering. I believe they were charged also, weren't they, David? I believe they were charged criminally, and I, I have not heard that those cases were settled. So I do believe they're facing, they're facing some serious charges. And of course, those just got a lot more real with the conviction. And then I think Chauvin just pled to a federal offense of deprivation. I think it was a civil rights. Civil rights. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, okay. yeah, they've, that's going to be a big issue. So that's all, that's all I wanted. And then what about Michael? So the question I have goes back about seven years ago in Independence. There was a kid, his dad was a Kansas City police officer, his name uh, Bryce Masters. And so he was in Independence and there was a police officer, Timothy Runnels. And they had had apparently confrontation before this goes back to the taser issue. So even though officer Runnels had been properly trained Apparently, he, this kid was annoying him, and so he held the taser for so long that the kid went into cardiac arrest, and then when he pulled the kid out of the car, he dropped his head on the concrete, which did enormous spatial damage, and so um, let's say luckily his dad was a police officer, and they were all white and all that kind of stuff, so you didn't have the racial element, but you did have the improper use of the uh, stun gun or the taser. And then he had the, um, I guess he, he got prosecuted for endangerment to a child. So if the kid would have been a few months older, he would have got away with it. But since he hadn't turned 18 yet. And so my question deals with proper use when you have this interpersonal conflict that happens among different people over time. Okay, and I'll, I'll speak of that because I know the uh, the young man's father. He was on KCPD. I know him personally, and if I remember correctly, and again, don't quote me, but I believe that officer had been kicked off of KCPD for excessive force, or one other agency for excessive force, before he was hired upon Independence. And like you said, that they'd had some previous contact with each other and again he was a hundred percent wrong you know i i'm telling you from my experience i don't have a problem telling you when police officers are wrong okay there's a thin blue line and everything but he talks about that but if you are wrong you are wrong and in that case he was 100 percent wrong and probably should not have ever been hired by Independence PD in the first place because of his previous record. So, Stan, the question I've got on that is that when an officer is fired for excessive use, what can be done to make sure that other departments know? And do we need some kind of a national law that says you can't, that if you lose your law enforcement Certi certification because of excessive use that no other police department can hire you then? Well, see, one of the problems is a lot of times in that situation, they can say, okay, you can resign or we can fire you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you choose to resign, then that information might not be made public to the next agency that you go to apply for, you know, because then it just looks like a resignation as opposed to a termination. 
you know, now once they start again, a lot of agencies, smaller agencies don't have the resources to do the background information of, say, a KCPD. And depending on, again, based on our society, depending on their shortages, they may look as better to get an experienced officer and get him trained quickly as opposed to hiring somebody off the street. You know, and uh, I know I'm going to open up another can of worms, but where people are talking about defunding the police, this is one of the problems that we're going to run into, okay? Because it's hard enough to get experienced and qualified people through the academy and everything, but then you're going to take resources from the police department and limit the, how much they can people they can get trained. Kansas City is approximately 300 officers short of what they should be. And a lot of agents, a lot of cities, uh, five years ago, Detroit put their fraternal order of police put out, said, don't come to Detroit because we can't guarantee your safety because we're so short. And I, I'll, I'll drop off that, that particular subject right now. I'm sorry. And so I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, thank you, Stan, and thank you, David. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me.